Welcome back. back. Welcome to Decision Space, the only show to take place right here in the space between the turns in your favorite games. I'm Brendan Hansen. I'm Jake Friedman. And this is the podcast about decisions in games. And today there is one additional person with us in this interdecisional spaceship cockpit piloting the show. And it is our good friend, Aurora. She is a competitive Keyforge player, a competitive Keyforge theory crafter, has also written some great articles on our Decision Space podcast website. And we are just absolutely delighted to have Aurora here with us to share her insights about Barrage. So Aurora, thanks for being here. Is there anything else you'd like to say to introduce yourself for our audience? No, it's really awesome to be here. I'm, uh, I've known Jake and Brendan from Keyforge Days, and I've uh, been on the Sanctimonious uh, uh, podcast before with uh, Jake, and uh, I'm happy to continue this uh, tradition of uh, joining your occasion. Awesome. Well, we are so excited to have you. Uh, and I think our listeners are in for a treat because I always think of you, no pressure, as sort of like one of the smartest board game, card game thinkers that I know. And you're always plugging into our Discord with some fantastic insights about the games you're playing. So I think this is going to be a treat for us as well as our listeners. Awesome. Let's get into it. Let's do it. And I just want to add, Aurora, I'm so thankful that you joined the show alongside us today because. I think you have a really fresh perspective in the way that you approach games. So I'm not going to put any pressure. Just Jake already piled up all the pressure. But I feel like whenever I'm approaching thinking about a game, I always like to to consult you. So I feel like you invariably have this other really interesting perspective that I never would have seen. So, and I know you're better than me at Barrage. So I just, I can't wait to get into it. Although Jake has won the last two games that we played together. I know. Such a scoundrel. I don't know how he keeps <laughs> doing this. I want to go back to the early days where Jake was complaining that I could actually win a game of Barrage against him. Before we get into our deep dive, a couple notes of housekeeping. First, we just want to make this readily apparent that Barrage was a game selected by our Patreon backers for us to cover. So thank you so much to all of our patrons for making this episode possible. What a great choice. Um, And if you want to be a part of our patron community, select the next patron game that we'll we'll be covering you can have some insight by supporting our show at any level and yeah we're just so grateful for all of you who are willing to support our show in in however way you see fit awesome should we get into bra the our ratings and reviews yeah let's do it okay i'll take the hard job of going first why not So I'll say that Barrage is a rich, system-driven, interactive experience that tries to do it all. I'm kind of blown away by how much there is in this one game. But I would say that Barrage remarkably succeeds in doing it all. Barrage is demanding. It asks a lot of its players, but it returns in spades and damnfuls, a roaring decision space full of rewarding decisions, fantastic variety, intrigue, and some of the most well-designed strategic and tactical trade-offs I've ever seen in a game i think 9.5 out of 10 i love barrage i think this game's phenomenal i'll go next barrage is a game that i found really intimidating to get into even though there were countless people in our discord heaping praise on this game and and playing it a ton on board game arena brendan really had to sort of drag me along kicking and screaming to get into my first game of barrage because i perceived it as this incredibly heavy complicated and punishing game where you'd be, you know, blocking players at every turn, essentially taking them out of the game via one tactical decision or tactical mistake. And what I found was, while all of that is true, this is undoubtedly a heavy game. It's undoubtedly a game that can feel really punishing. It's also a game that gives players a lot of opportunity to just have fun and play the game no matter how poorly your game's going, you still get the same amount of workers, still get the same amount of opportunity to play around with than anyone else. And I found it just a complete joy to explore and a delight to play around in. So I think this might be my favorite heavy, like truly heavy Euro game I've ever played. And I think I'm going to give it a 9.5 out of 10 as well. Ooh, okay. Aurora, what do you think of Barrage? <laughs> uh, okay, here it is. Uh, The day after my first play of Barrage, I posted on social media asking, is a day without playing Barrage worth living? At the time, I didn't have (laughs) the option of playing Barrage every day. A sad life indeed. But ever since Barrage became available on BGA, I have at least 
one game of bar barrage running at all times. As an aspiring game designer, I'm always on the lookout for conflict that isn't combat, and barrage provides that in such a unique and exciting way. I can't wait to explore it every time I sit down to play. 10 out of 10. Let's go. So uh, clearly a game that we all love a ton. But for the rest of this episode, you know, we can kind of set those reviews aside and really get into the decisions in the game and dive deep into sort of what makes it tick and what makes that decision space, as Aurora pointed out, so unique. Um, so let's jump over into our deep dive now and start as always, with our game background. Brush is a, a fairly recent game designed in, or released in 2019 from Cranio Creations, which is an Italian publisher who's done a lot of games uh, with Simone Luciani, who's one of the designers of Brush. Uh, so uh, also Brush is designed by Tommaso Battista. So Cranio Creations has done games like Golem, Newton, and Lorenzo, uh, Magnifico, all Simone Luciani games. And you might know Simone Luciani from other games like Zulkin the Mayan Calendar, 2015's The Voyages of Marco Polo, those two uh, games he did with Daniel Cicini, and then also Grand Austria Hotel, which was co-designed by Simone Luciani with uh, Virginio Gigli. And then also Simone Luciani just has like tons and tons of heavy Euro games, right? So I mentioned Golem already. There's Tiletum, which Jake uh, mentioned on a recent uh, show, the one that he was really anticipating and kind of bounced off of, and then kind of hit them all. Marco Polo, Newton, Lorenzo. Do any of you have experience with these other games outside of, you know, we've obviously, we've covered Grand Austria Hotel on the show. The one thing that jumps out to me when I look at this list is very polarizing for me. The Voyages of Marco Polo 1 is one of my favorite games of all time. I also absolutely love Grand Austria Hotel, another one that we've covered on this podcast. But as you indicated, Tilla Tomb, I really bounced off of. Tzolkin is a game I think I want to, I appreciate, you know, more than I actually have enjoyed all my plays of. And Lorenzo and Marco Polo 2, I also bounced off of those games pretty hard as well. So for me, an incredibly exciting designer with just incredible peaks, uh, but also some valleys in there as well. What about you, Aurora? Uh, the only game on this list that I have played is the uh, Grand Astro Hotel, and I have not been able to get into it. I tried it maybe twice, and I just, I just didn't feel any connection to the to the gameplay at all. I think I might have a different experience if I tried to play it on the table, but uh, I also I'm also not very comfortable with Yukata. It makes me like. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> I would love for us to just jump right into the the review. I think that's really important. But the one thing I'll say at the outset is for Grand Austria Hotel. I think the thing that helps Raj for me. I also bounced off of Grand Austria a little bit. There's just signposts everywhere. Uh, and I, I think in a lot of these Luciani designs, they're really well signposted games, which is really important because the decision space is just so massive. What what I like most about Barrage, uh, at least in my earlier, earlier plays, is how much feedback I got from the game of, you screwed up. <laughs> Don't do this again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump into our sort of decision space exploration and to bridge us there, We'll have the interdecisional spaceship computer play Brendan's pre-recorded game synopsis and rules overview. Uh, good luck with this one, Brendan. Braj is a heavy worker placement Euro optimization game played on a shared board where two to four players compete to build infrastructure and manage the flow of water to produce energy. The board depicts mountains and headwaters at its top and rivers flowing down the board into a series of basins below. Peppered throughout this interconnected network of rivers, are locations for players to build dams, powerhouses, and conduits. The three key pieces of infrastructure needed to produce energy using water trapped behind a dam. Competition for key building locations on the board is fierce, and it's this competition that's the primary driver of Barrage being a highly interactive game. Players can and must control the flow of water by damming locations and rerouting water through the production of energy. It's cheaper for players to build at the bottom of the mountain, but doing so means they're more vulnerable 
to having their infrastructure interrupted by a player building further up on the mountain, potentially cutting off their access to water and stifling their plans. Accompanying the main board is a shared worker placement game that drives the mechanical actions in Barrage. Each round, players begin with a set number of workers to compete for a variety of action spaces that scale by player count. Shared action spaces allow players to produce energy using water trapped behind dams they control or neutral dams, place water in the head streams, allowing water to flow down in future rounds, gain money, which players need to pay for some of the worker placement locations and for some of the building locations on the board, gain excavators and mixers, resources used to build pieces on the board, acquire contracts that they can fulfill by producing energy and receive points or other benefits in return, gain new technology tiles giving players special building abilities, or turn their construction wheel a number of sp spaces. In addition to utilizing these shared worker placement spaces, however, players can play workers to their own personal player board to take building actions. Doing this, they're able to place a building or add elevation to their dam to increase the water it can hold onto the board. However, to pay for this building action, players have to place mixers or excavators onto their personal construction wheel and a building tile showing the building that they're building. Each player's construction wheel has six segments, and this re represents the number of buildings the player must build or spaces they must advance using actions in the worker placement board to get the excavators and mixers and building tile that they use to pay for that initial building back to their supply, such that they can use all those materials in future build actions. The timing puzzle of when to build what and where is another key tension at the core of Brage. Each player has an asymmetric player board that's unique to the country they're playing. France, the United States, Italy, etc. And when they build buildings, they remove building pieces from their personal board and add them to the main board. Doing so may reveal an income bonus that players gain immediately when revealed and at the end of each of Barrage's five rounds, which occurs when all the players in the round have used all their workers. Additionally, each player has a unique player power that they unlock by building their third powerhouse, which gives them a fundamentally different way to approach the game and may play an important role in their strategic path through the game. Alongside this, each player randomly receives an assistant at the start of each game, which grants them a unique special ability. This means each play of Barrage feels fresh and offers a unique set of options and challenges. Barrage presents players with many ways to score points, but some of the key ones include fulfilling contracts by producing energy, producing the most energy in a round, randomized round-based scoring objectives that reward players for buildings they've built of certain types, variable game and scoring objectives, income from player boards, and more. After five rounds, the player with the most points is crowned the victor. All right, thank you as always, Brendan, for taking care of that rules overview. Hopefully that gives you at home a little bit of a better idea of how to play this game if you're not already familiar. So let's get right into it. Let's characterize the decision space, talking size, depth, type, feel, clarity. We've already indicated it's really big, but maybe we should start first with the type. Aurora, do you want to maybe kind of kick us off here? Um, it feels like like it would be waning, but it, it doesn't always like play out that way. Like maybe in the last round, it really feels like it's constricted. But during the game, it, it it's pretty dynamic. The, the options like kind of go and shrink based on uh, the resources you have available. And uh, because of the the way of the rondel works in this game and that it doesn't turn on its own, means that you kind of have to push yourself forward to have more options. So it's, it's kind of dynamic, I think, uh, with maybe a waning round five. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, especially when you just the way that the board state is flowing. Um, to your point, Aurora, where even some rounds, there might not be as much water in your dams. So those rounds is sort of really, okay, I'm in this position that isn't great from a production side. What can I do to make sure I have a really big production turn in round four or five to kind of make up for this week or round three, or, or maybe it's round two or four or whatever, just somewhere in the mid game. Maybe your infrastructure isn't quite there yet. And then there's also these elements will, where maybe you'll get a new technology tile that really changes the way you can approach building in the late game or the way you can approach getting points in the, in the mid game in a way that you hadn't thought. But then at the same time, there's sort of this terminal point for all of the buildings that you can put out because there's only so many buildings of each type that you can place. 
so in that way, it almost feels uh, waning, but you so rarely get to the end of, I've never built all my buildings in the game of Barrage. And I think that's why it sort of feels dynamic is because you can push it in so many directions and you rarely bump up against any rails that would be there outside of, like you were saying, Aurora, oh gosh, I really just want to turn this construction wheel and I'm mad that I have to pay to spend workers to turn it around or maybe five five money on top of it. What do you think, Jake? Yeah, I think you guys really nailed a lot of my thoughts, so I don't want to reiterate too much of what was said, but I think the decision space that I find this somewhat analogous to is underwater cities. It has some of that same sense of um, like a punctuated Mm. waning space, but where you're building up between turns, right? You can sort of do more, um, uh, more often than not in subsequent rounds of the game because you do have that infrastructure built up and building some pieces of infrastructure give you persistent bonuses that you'll get at the beginning of each round but the fundamental difference and i think what makes it more dynamic than that is you don't just get everything back right you're not always starting each round with the with all of your resources yes you get all your workers back and the you know uh, worker placement spots wane down predictably, but you don't necessarily have your resources because they're tied up in that rondelle, which you have to sort of pick and choose your spots for how you're going to progress that along. So you could begin a round with all your workers and have literally no resources to spend. Um, so I think that makes it feel more dynamic than these kind of typical punctuated waning decision spaces that we've talked about on the show a lot in the past. You also... To, to play the waxing side of things a little bit, you start, which is why I think ultimately it's dynamic. We can find these waning elements, we can find the waxing elements, but you start this game very poor. You know, you start off and you're sort of say, I want to take a build action. Oh, what can I do? Not so much, right? You really have to figure out the early puzzle to say, how can I build up excavators and mixers to actually be able to do what I want to do, not just what I have to do? So, and you'll also have turns of this where The final round five, if you set it up right, you might, you know, produce 30, 40 energy. Whereas the early rounds of the game, round one, you're happy to break into six energy produced, you know? So from that perspective, it can almost feel waxing just in the feedback from the game sort of saying, you did it. You built an engine, more or less, kind of, not really, probably, but sort of. Yeah, I I don't, I, I almost never feel like I have an engine in Barrage. It's like... I managed to build something that can sort of walk if I push it really hard. It doesn't, it doesn't walk itself. You almost, it's sort of the type of engine where it's, you've built just the machine to get you from point A to point B. Like, and oh gosh, I'm so lucky that I wound up with just these pieces of water this turn, right? And I think a huge part of that is if you sat with the puzzle of barrage on the table, you could build this really wonderful engine, right? Where okay, water's going to pour from here and then I'm going to reroute it to here and then I can use that to produce to here to reroute it to this dam. But in real life, you know, Jake's over here putting dams right above yours. Aurora's putting dams above Jake's and then no one gets access to anything. Right, or you've you've done all the infrastructure building but all the the water is sitting in other people's dams, right? So you have this great uh, infrastructure but nothing to run through it because yeah. you've spent so much time prioritizing those build actions and, and the resources you need to accomplish that, that you've sort of failed in this other key aspect. And I think those rich trade-offs are just like the hallmark of, for me, like the feel of this game is sort of this, and we'll talk more about the trade-offs later, but but trading off between building an engine or of, of you know a good infrastructure and actually making sure you're doing the things that are going to get you some point because the game is so tied up um, in the scoring structure of scoring at the end of each round and then producing at the beginning of the round that you really have to think not just about the long game of building your engine each time but like those key point trade-offs of like oh I need to like hit this benchmark now so I'm gonna like sacrifice what ultimately might be like the long-term better play to make sure I'm like not taking a minus four by getting up to a certain amount of energy. And and that kind of thing is just like riddled throughout the game with those trade-offs. Yeah, I maybe those trade-offs to me are part of what makes this game so fun because oftentimes you, I don't know that I've ever played a game of Barrage where you could just sort of look at it and say, 
or played a game like Barrage where it's as well signposted. You know, at the start of each game, you can see in round one, this is what you're going to be rewarded for at the end of the round based on the energy track payout, right? So maybe it's conduits, and then maybe it's the warehouses, then maybe it's the powerhouses. And then you can also see what the only game end objective is going to be at the very outset. But there's so many things to do and you get in each other's ways so much that it rarely feels like you're actually accomplishing what you hoped. And sometimes even the way that those energy production tiles come out, it doesn't really make as much sense for scoring big. So you kind of have to use your past knowledge and interpret it. It's almost like the game sort of says, I'm going to give you as much information as possible to make this game feel really strategic. And it is. I think this game is one of those classic games where it's like, is this more tactical or strategic? Is it 50% tactical and 50% strategic? And I think ultimately for Braj, what I've decided is it's just 75% strategic and 75% tactical. Just as a baseline. <laughs> I can't solve the question. Would it surprise you to know that I completely ignore all the signposts until like round four? Really? <laughs> That's amazing. So let's... When we're talking signposts, Brendan, are you talking specifically about like your end game goal and then each of the rounds scoring That's objectives? Exactly right. yeah. Okay. Yep. The, on yeah. the only one that I consider early is if you got that uh, end game scoring of having your um, buildings on the, on the red spaces mm. because mm -hmm. that's worth starting early. But all the other ones, I just, I, d I don't look at it at all. I just look at how to maximize my points later in the game when I get to, okay, I could do a bunch of stuff. I'm not sure what to do. I could go for one of these objectives. But earlier in the game, I play, uh, th there is a strategy behind it. Like I'm, I'm usually guided by what kind of tech tiles are available and what can I get. And of course, my board and assistant and th that stuff, uh, which is that, that gives you, yeah, that gives you another signpost to what you should be doing with your, uh, I don't know, Water Empire. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't look at the scoring objectives at all until much later in the game because I, I really feel like if I could build a conduit now instead of something else, it will be profitable for, for like four points or whatever. I, I, want, I want to build my infrastructure in a way that it's sustainable and... That's very hard to do in conjunction with the end game objectives and stuff like that. So I just mostly ignore them until like, like round four, where when I'm just not sure what I should be doing anymore because it's not it's not important for my you know my my, my map presence anymore. Yeah, I think that highlights too why I sort of feel like the game is so highly signposted, Aurora, because you you can ignore these two signposts that we're talking about, and then you mentioned three others almost, right? The, yeah. Your company board, which is a signpost in a way of sort of what what income do I need to unlock? Also the technology tiles that you mentioned. And then you mentioned another thing. Um, I don't even know. There's also just the, the building of like what spots are available based on where the neutral dams are. Yeah. And how can I get early foothold within that network that exists? I might be unsurprising, but I feel like I straddle the line between y'all. Like, okay. I think probably a little bit more on Aurora's side of not paying too, too much attention to the end game scoring objectives. But one thing I find really matters is the order of um, the end of round scoring, right? So at the end of each round, it'll tell you, you get points for each different building type. And then the really key one is the number of contracts you've completed, because I think where that contract one comes up can really drastically change the scoring potential and, and feel of the game for how heavily you want to go for contracts. If that's the first one to come up, then I think that contract space where you can go to get more contract is just so much less competitive and less valuable than if that one happens to be at the end of round five. Yeah. And then every single contract you complete over the course of the game is going to matter. So I think like at, at the very least, I'm paying attention to that. I think the building ones less so because I find that the game rewards you for sort of trying to have a balance, right? You want to kind of unlock the bonuses, um, you know, and if you're, if you're building all dams with no way to convert it to energy, right? That's not going to help you out either. So you do have to build the conductors and the power plants or whatever. So it's sort of like, I find myself typically going for a balanced approach to buildings with that small caveat that like, 
where that contract one is, I really do pay attention to that. I feel like part of the tough thing about having a conversation about barrage like this is it's always easy to find an exception, right? So I'm going to try not to dwell on exceptions. But I just want to respond to what you said slightly, Jake, too, because I think one of the fun things about barrage is some of those sort of some of the games, the shape of the rewards make it such that I think what you just said is completely true, where you don't want to just focus on dams early on because you want to think about how your network will build up and maybe have a more even game, right? Where you're producing all the way through the game. But then I think some of them pay off such that maybe it makes sense to try to get all three of my powerhouses online by round two, really go hard on my company power or my country power. Uh, the theming in this game is a whole other thing, like, but we could get into that later if we feel like it. But it, you know, I think the game, the system is robust enough, and there's so many ways to score points that you, depending on your positions and the advanced tiles that you get access to, maybe because those building actions really enable you to push at the edges. And I think when that happens, there can be reasons to run towards a mid-game scoring objective a little bit. But it's like both you were saying, what is it? It's okay if I can score twelve points in round three off the building objectives. That's amazing, but it's also not that much. So it's kind of, it's always, there's always another path. And that's a cool just, thing about Just Barrage. to be clear, I'm, I'm not saying like it's not a good idea to look at those. <laughs> I'm saying I don't. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. If you want to score 150 points per game, you should probably look at them. Sure. <laughs> Can we hit one more point on characterizing decision space? Because I think it ties in a little bit with, um, the point Aurora was making about strong feedback, feedback. in this game, yeah. which is the clarity of the decision space. And I find that this game starts out as an incredibly fuzzy decision space, right? It's very like when you're doing your first couple of actions and really the first round, you're sort of like finding your way through a, a fog, I feel. But everything you do in this game, right? You're building infrastructure, which clarifies your own personal decision space a little bit more, right? If I built a power plant here previously, then these are some of the spaces that would make more sense to build a dam in later and so on and so forth, right? Your decisions kind of build on each other in a clarifying way, almost from round one through the end, where by the end of the game, you've got a totally clear decision space where it's just, I can calculate how many points I'm going to get from each of these actions very clearly so i just take the most profitable one which i think is why this game does have such a strong sense of feedback because if you're you know building a power plant early trying to find your way through the fog and then you're like oh obviously it makes sense to build a dam here now and somebody takes that space you're like oof right <laughs> that now i'm really feeling that um that feedback in a significant way one of my earliest games on bga i like routinely build a dam on the lower spot on the lower mountain on the lower spot and the not the one that doesn't cost uh the not red spot and just for somebody built it immediately right on top of me and i'm like <laughs> wait you can do that <laughs> i think that that's such a good point though so if you haven't played barrage there's basically the ability to completely block someone's dam they could have invested maybe seven workers worth of actions to build up this nice little dam for themselves that's going to build just a little bit of energy early on you put down one piece then build an elevation and you might completely stymie their engine it's the sort of action that in a nicer euro game you would say right it leads to this sort of wait in this game i can do what yeah. because it's sort of you know jake's over there doing his homework nicely and you just walk over and stand in front of the screen can't read it oh sorry about that I do want to draw one point of clarification. It's not that you could never then do anything with your sure. dam. Because I think that, and I, the reason I want to bring this up is because I think hearing people talk about this game in those terms are a big reason why I like felt like this isn't for me. It's going to be one of those games where you make one mistake and then you don't get to have any fun for the next hour and a half of your life. There are still things you can do, right? If you put water that flows in excess over that dam, it will go into yours. But it's it is definitely it hurts you. There's no way around that. I'm not saying it doesn't, but it's not as though your expense is going to forever be totally useless. There's also yeah, you're just doing your homework specifically for handed. those uh, dams and on the lower level. Um, there is a lot of value in having three, if one dam on each of the streams, uh, and it doesn't meet, man, matter if it's at the top one or the bottom one because you just want to get dams in on the boat so you can get the income from the dams. 
uh, depending on which uh, board you are, like for example, uh, I think the USA one uh, has your uh, uh, rondel rotation when you have two dams. So you want to get those down and you don't really care if those dams are used yet later to storing water. You just want them on the board and then you can build more dams later in the highest places to get the, the water down. I also wanted to kind of in response to something that Jake said earlier about the, the clarity um, earlier in the game. Like after you've played this game a bunch, there aren't that many opening construction moves you can do because you're limited not only by uh, the walkers that you have, um, like the mixers and stuff, uh, but also the technology ties that you you start with, uh, like and and I I keep getting tripped up by this even after seventy games online. Like uh, just just this game uh, that started recently, I really wanted to build a second power plant. I even I even got my uh, g- my gray cement mixer or whatever it is, and I, I had three. But then I realized I don't have the technology tile to build a power plant, so I can't actually start with two power plants on the board. There's just no way to do that unless there's a technology tile that you can buy that can build a power plant. So like the, the amount of combinations that you can put of buildings on the board early in round one is like not that high, which I think helps the game a lot uh, in the introduction phase because you, you kind of, you know, you need to build a dam and and the conduit and the power plant. That That's pretty much it. <laughs> and it's further clarified by the uh, random layout of the board, right? Where you have just a few neutral dams that are going to be on the board and some of those with water in them already, which kind of can incentivize you even further to build, oh, I'll build a conduit next to this dam that already has water in it that I might be able to use in this first round. And there's really precious few ways to get any energy going in that first round and it's even further clear by by the fact that the headwaters tell you what waters will be added to the game in what uh what dam basically what rivers what streams all the way through round five that's something that i love so much about this game is that you know from the initial planning it's the sort of game where i feel like you might set it up okay if the three of us were playing at a table we'll pass out our boards we'll we'll get all set up and then we just sit there for 15 minutes almost Right. And like stare at the board planning what we think we might want to do because there's so much information that you can take in. And to Jake, your point, you know, part of the reason why it's not clear is because what matters is our pieces going to the board. That's what will really shape the decision space fundamentally. And then so much of the game is, well, when and where do we get to place based on what we do over in the worker placement spot? We spent so much time talking about the board, talking about our construction wheels, but then, you know, going on sort of driving all this, there's this really tight, almost claustrophobic at times worker placement puzzle. That's so fun because it's all trade-offs. You know, if I take the the double contracts, then Jake's going to have, then Jake's going to take the construction action and Aurora's going to be able to buy another, advanced technology tile and it's like is that worth it okay no maybe i want the advanced technology tile i feel like over there it's it's just large enough that there's lots of meaningful paths but small enough that every path is sort of painful in terms of the opportunity cost of what you give up and i love that especially about the power generation ones because of the bonus mm-hmm. uh which is also very different if yeah, depending on the number of players you're playing like uh, in four players, if you, if you miss the opportunity to take the first one, then you're only going to get a bonus of plus one instead of plus two. But in three players, that plus one is not there. So you only get, so you get plus zero generation instead of plus two, which is a huge hit. That is an, um, an enormous opportunity cost if you don't take that first. Definitely. And even in the competition for, right, this feels like a true worker placement game, I think, because the competition for those spaces is so real. You might even take a space that isn't that helpful for you just to keep it away from somebody else. You know, if I can, I can hardly get much benefit out of the plus two versus the zero, but if I leave it for a roar, she's going to be able to, you know, use this particular dam to get one of these sort of shared massive objectives that could be worth 10 plus points so you can really you know there, there's strong player interaction there and sort of the just like you know keeping somebody at arm's length from getting those big achievements too i don't think i've ever done that 
<laughs> You've never gotten the objectives or no, never taken an action just to prevent somebody else? Yeah, never taken an action to prevent somebody else from taking it. Uh, but maybe, maybe it's more likely to do that in a two-player game, but in a four-player game or three-player game, I always feel that so much I want to do and so much I want to accomplish that spending time to block somebody else just feels too detrimental for me. Interesting. I think, I mean, it's still going to be good for you. And I, I'm almost the opposite. Like in a four player game, if I'm first to go, like I wanted, I almost always just to like snap, just take that plus two energy generation just because it's not going to hurt me. It's going to be good for me in some small way, but it might, you know, it, it's taking it away from everybody else. And yeah, you can pay the extra worker and some gold to still get access to it. But really, especially late game, like that extra worker can be so big that I don't know. I it, It's difficult for me to talk myself out of taking it when available. I find that one of the really tricky things for me about Barrage with a worker placement puzzle is exactly what you just said too, Jake, that one extra worker can be so big. The Sometimes I find myself falling into the trap of, oh, I'll just take the, I'll just skip it. I'll do this other action and then I'll just pay a little extra. I'll pay one extra worker and three extra gold and I'll take the action. And then all of a sudden I, I find myself losing terribly because that one extra worker, you know, you do that three times. It's not always one extra, right? There's different amounts extra that the extra spaces could cost, but usually it's one more worker. But if you do that three times, that's like a turn that you've given up in barrage compared to your opponents that they're always taking two action spaces instead. And I find that that sort of marginal efficiency is really fun. And it's not done with money, right? It's not done with paying. It's just this sort of efficiency leak that you couldn't, you might not realize until it's sort of, you look down at the board and Jake and Aurora have played all their pieces to the left side. And then I've played all my pieces to the right. And it's like, oh, that's why I'm behind. I'm just doing less and paying more for the privilege. Great. Yeah, I can see that happening, yeah. I think that's such an interesting challenge. Like, one of the things that makes the puzzle, the worker placement puzzle specifically uh, interesting here is exactly that, that you can place to your personal player board or the shared yeah. player board. And I almost feel, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, Aurora, that the most efficient play is almost to just, and you can't always do this, but it feels like I want to wait as long as possible to take any actions on my player board. Like I want to be done with all my shared actions. And then I can, if I can take my last three turns of any given round, just building, that's almost like the most efficient way to play. I think it really depends on what kind of strategies you're going for. Uh, I often go for a heavy construction strategy. And in those cases, I often need to make sure that I place my buildings as efficiently as, poss as, efficiently as possible um, so I don't get blocked in my positioning. So like, yeah, using the shared worker spaces before your personal worker spaces makes sense for the worker placement, but <laughs> using your personal board makes you use the physical board of the streams before other players, which is also... A priority so yeah it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish long term like if you're trying to um generate uh, energy uh, then you might want to make sure that you get those uh, plus two power generations as, as quickly as possible and be prepared with the, like the context to fulfill but if you're going for a more construction strategy then you might want to build as soon as possible and make sure that nobody takes your spaces on the board um and i guess the ideal play for the most points lays somewhere in between those two. Like you need to both build and generate power and complete contracts to really get a lot of points in this game. You know what you just made me think is that I think I'm approaching this game with a little bit of two player bias because most of my plays have been just going against Brendan. We probably played like 10 games against each other at this point. We played a ton. So that's been the majority of my plays. And there, because you always use the same board, regardless of player count, like the actual placement spots on the board are so much more open on the two-player game, but you trade out the worker placement spots so that those remain really tight. So I think that perhaps the game prioritizes the worker placement puzzle a little bit more in two-player games, where if you're playing at a max player count, it prioritizes a bit more the competitive uh 
building places on the board. I do think, okay, well, two things. It scales when there's more players, right? So there's inherently more flexibility at higher player counts in the worker placement part, just because there's more spots. So even if proportionally it's the same, there's more room for people to push at certain parts in the game to certain of the worker placement areas. Like production, when everyone has water in their dams, just really fills up, but it leaves the other spaces more open. But I think also, Jake, it's this is just... Part of why people, I, or maybe part of why I love Barrage so much, is that it's a game of quandaries. And this is one of those quandaries, right? It's better to play to your board last, except when it's not. It's better to play at the bottom of the mountain because it's cheaper, except when it's terrible, right? <laughs> it's, you know, that's that's sort of what, there's a bunch of those sort of, it's great to do X until it's absolutely, you, you never should have done X. There's a few of those at the heart of Barrage, those sort of like core quandaries or core tensions that I think just make the game so fun because they're really, there's no right answer. It's all based upon what everyone does to follow you oftentimes also, you know, how other people end up building. I think it's really interesting Definitely. that you've played mostly at two players because I really like it at two players, but I generally don't because I can play online with as many people as exactly as many people as I want. Um, but uh, to your point, I think that a two-player game can be extremely mean. Like, if you, if you really want, you can just take all the water from somebody and flow it down another stream. <laughs> Jake and I basically, Aurora, when we would play, we would have... I would almost classify it. Jake, tell me if I'm wrong. We would play a really fighty mean game, and it would make both of us mad. So the next game, I would build on the left side of the mountain, and Jake would build on the right. And then the next game, we'd be back to fighting. We just kind of switch back and forth based on based on the play. That's do you awesome. think that's fair, Jake? Yeah, I, I do. And it was it was interesting too because I think it le- lends itself a bit more in the two player game to being more swingy. Right, where if somebody gets out to an early lead, sometimes they can kind of snowball it just a bit. Um, so we, we had a lot of like games that would just like wildly swing back and forth. But then when when we both like were allowed to play our own game, that was when we had like our tightest sort of scoring bands. Yeah. I yep. think just we're talking about it now, maybe we should, you know, if anybody else has anything to say about player counts, favorite player counts. I did just look up at uh board game geek. And it shows that 73% of people think that this game is best at four. Um, but it's still recommended, uh, 61% still recommend it at two. So I think still a perfectly fine experience there. For me personally, I think I've enjoyed my two and three player games more than my four player games just because I don't necessarily need that incredibly tight board um to get like full enjoyment out of it right i I think that is where you're most likely to encounter negative player experience to the extent that it does exist in this game of just being like okay i just got like totally boxed out and that's that that's it's much more difficult for that to happen in two and three player games um i think that yeah i think i agree i think i might i mean i have not played a lot in two but i think i i like three more than four uh especially uh, because of the thing I mentioned with the power supply, uh, the power the pro- that power production action, which jumps from zero to plus two, I think it's much much more interesting than the zero plus one plus two that comes in a four player game. Yeah, I don't remember how I, it is so in tw- it, two player. I think it's zero plus two, and then is it minus two, and that's it? I okay, think so. so. Yeah, yeah it's not minus one. Three. Yeah, I also so. I interestingly, my learning experience with this game kind of mirrored. I had a really hard time learning this game. I found it very frustrating. I was mostly playing at four players. I knew Jake and I were, we were covering it on the show. So I just stuck with it and I played it mostly at three and four. Then Jake, I was really trying to get you on board. I was like, we got to do this game. We have to do this game. We told the patrons we'd do it. (laughs) We told the patrons we'd do it. So we have to do it. And also I was sort of like, I think Jake's going to love this game. And it's kind of right where we both are. And then Aurora, I was talking with you and you said, oh, it's fine at two. Why don't you like it at two? And then I thought to myself, I guess I'd never tried it. So then I invited Jake to a two-player game and I realized I love this game at two, mostly because it does feel, the zero-sum nature just keeps you really engaged and it is a little bit more forgiving on the board like Jake was saying. But I think it also, it opens up some, I I don't know. I, I think it's great at two and three and four. I prefer it at two and three. Four is fine, but it feels like 
I was just at a party yesterday with eight toddlers in a small room. <laughs> and a little bit, it feels like that, right? You can't, like, everyone's fighting. You got to get in there, but you, you almost don't want to jump in for fear that someone's going to get in your way. It's fun. It's interesting. I like it. I think I like it at three where I have slightly more agency, but the interaction still is forced. At two, you can ignore each other. And it feels a little bit like the spirit of Barrage starts to to disappear slightly. I just want to... Yeah, you'll still like be it. interacting, but... I just yeah. want to give uh, a little credit um, uh, to Indo from the Dis- Decision, Space, uh, Decision Space Discord. Uh, he brought me in to some different strategies in Barrage. Uh, he gave me the idea of going for a purely construction strategy, and he told me that it's greater too, and you should try it. Just like I, I said something about the two player map, which was supposed to come out or has come out, I'm not sure. And he said it was just play that map at two, and I'm like, huh, didn't think of that. <laughs> yeah, Indoor is also incredible at this game, just routinely seems to be smoking people in our Discord. So, a good person to learn from for sure. The last thing I wanted to say about player counts, too, is just an important caveat for our listeners that, at least for Brendan and I, and it sounds like, or you're in the same boat, that a lot of our plays are asynchronous. And I think that um, that tends to just feel a little bit better at lower player counts, unless you have a super active group that's really just clipping along, along quickly, because especially when you're trying to learn this game, it can feel like frustrating to be in a four player asynchronous game. Uh, and then, you know, it's been a full day or something and you're like, what was I even trying to do here? I know it's not working, but I don't even know what I was going for at this point. I, I've played it uh, live on the table quite a bit too, like at least uh-huh. 12 games. So oh, I, nice. I can definitely say that this game works excellent on the table. And uh, the dime downtown is pretty low because you keep going around the table and taking actions. And you, if people are not uh, analysis but analysis prone, they can definitely work out roughly what they would like like to do on their turn because you just usually can build something or produce energy or something like that. And Hopefully you're not playing with any Brendan Hansen types who are asking everyone to sit quietly at the table for 15 minutes before you even take your first turn. <laughs> I said we might. We might. It's not, <laughs> not forced. <laughs> um, can we, just before we sort of, I think we should talk about asymmetry, but before we get there, maybe we could talk about the, I guess we're maybe by doing this, we are talking about those special construction tiles that you get via the patent office. Uh, I, when I first started playing this game, because I was intimidated by the number of systems going on, how much they all interacted, I sort of thought, okay, I'll just sort of ignore the patent office. And then I quickly realized that's the worst thing you could do in Barrage. <laughs> you, and subsequently I realized at the start of the game, the, one of the most common openings is really you just pick a advanced technology tile and you start to build your strategy around it. Like Aurora, you said earlier, I think that people talk about asymmetry and barrage. And I think what initially comes to mind for a lot of people is the company powers and the unique player boards. But I think for me, some of the asymmetry, not in the way that it's an asymmetric game, but just an asymmetric element are these technology tiles and how strongly they inform your ability to push uh, to parts of the decision space. You couldn't go unless you had one of these tiles or a combination of these tiles. And I find that this system to me is what takes Barrage from being a, it, what would surely be a great game to just an exceptional game. I, I can't say enough about how wonderful these tiles are. And a part of it is that it's that you're unlocking these new powers. That's really cool. But it's also the fact that it's coupled with the building action. And like you were saying earlier, Roar, the fact that I could build two powerhouses in one turn and do that while not placing workers for either one of them because I have this special tile, just kind of takes, it's that special sauce for me in the game that makes every play feel sort of special and almost unrecreatable. So I love this system. I think it's great. Uh, yeah. I Have you ever played with the, with, the, with the basic game without the pattern office and you get the question mark I technology haven't. tile? Good. No. You don't do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the game is kind of sad. Maybe my it. first time. Yeah. Not even. Not even. Yeah. Just if you if you if you find it too complicated to walk with the patent office, just ignore it. But like it it makes the game so much less exciting when you don't have that super tile that does something special. Like there are uh, I think five level one tiles. Uh, there is one that uh, the special ones that always grab my attention is the 
elevation tile that pushes your uh, rondel around the number of times equal to the number of elevations that you've already built, which just completely boosts any construction strategy. And they're also the conduit that generates money, which is uh, can be really amazing, especially if you have the, uh, the assistant that uh, can spend free money instead of a worker in the construction. Uh, that combination is always really good. Um, the other ones aren't as exciting, but they're still good. Like you can you can have that uh, that dam that brings in water. Uh, you can you can make that work. Yeah, it almost feels we're going to talk about the you know special player powers that are the traditional asymmetry in this game, the building boards and the uh, CEO or whatever they're called that you have to start with. But it feels like because it is such a common strategy that you start round one by taking one of these, that it almost feels like your third power that you can really signpost your strategy around. And especially getting in that first round and using it, you know it's going to be coming back to you again later in the game once or twice even, or I guess potentially more if you're doing like a super building strategy. Uh, So yeah, you can really sort of, like this might be okay in the first round or even not great, but but the second time you're using it, it, building up to that, it's going to be, even more impactful for you. Um, But I think kind of transitioning a little bit into the asymmetry, these two are things that really helped you, helped me uh, get into the game and learn the game because I found that like I could take a certain tile, like every time it was available and try and like learn how to use that. So I think the one uh, that I, my favorite uh, technology tile is the one that like when you build a power plant, and you get to like automatically produce, produce. Interesting. And I sort of was I've like, never managed to make that. Work. Well, I was well for whatever reason. Uh, maybe it's just like the way I was intuitively approaching the game uh, with like more of kind of like an all rounder strategy or something like that. Um, that that fit in really nicely, and I tried to take it whenever it was available and sort of you know get the most out of it that I could. Um, and that being able to sort of like either get the same building board or the same CEO or the same starting um, or not starting, but the same patent tile in the first round, like having one or two of those being the same made me feel a lot more like comfortable getting into this game quicker than I think if everything was always completely different, if that makes sense. Definitely. I think another thing that really helped. So when I was learning this game, I knew Bar- I knew of Barrage's asymmetry. It was something that when I had heard of Barrage, it was sort of one of the things that came to the top, right? Every every board has a unique player power. But then you learn the rules and the fact that they're the designers put them in jail. You have to unlock them. You, they're behind three builds. But I think that, and, and that really surprised me. I was sort of like, oh, this game isn't really that asymmetric. But in thinking about it and playing Barrage more, I love that there's games where you push towards the asymmetry early on. And there also, there can be plays of this where you might never unlock your unique player power. And those are interesting. But it also is this sort of novel trick where the game gets to be an asymmetric game, but then you diminish some of the trade-offs around pure asymmetry in terms of balance so that you know that in the early game, you as designers, right, they sort of can worry about those powers a little bit less in terms of unbalancing, imbalancing the early stages of the game because you just haven't unlocked them yet. So it's this sort of like wonderful party trick of this is an asymmetric game, but we don't have to worry about the imbalances that could be created as much if you just started with those powers right at the front. Well, and I think I, that's really cool. I, I think that... For me personally, the country power that you unlock when you buy build your third power plant is not that interesting. <laughs> I, 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 except of France's one, which makes the uh, contacts cost uh, free less, I don't really use them. They feel a little mm. clunky and not powerful enough. Uh, I, I find that the true s- asymmetry in this game comes from the different positions of your incomes on your board. Uh, which can be really significant. Like the USA has the rondel rotation on the dams, and I think Germany has it on the conduits. And one of them, I think it's uh, I think it's France has it on the dams, but only on the fourth dam. So it's really hard to get to uh, automatic rotations. So that really changes how you need to play the game. And the other asymmetry is, of course, the assistance, which to me, feel much more powerful than the country abilities. Um, like, 
all of them except the 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 one where you can copy somebody else assistant which i i i don't really understand why that exists <laughs> yeah don't give don't give the new player that one i think i had that in my first game and i was like okay so i i just have to know what all the other powers are and how to use them that's it's rough. not only that it's just it just makes it like a worse version of all the other powers unless unless you're in a four player game and then you have the variety is helpful otherwise it's just the, the additional cost is like too much in most cases um also, uh, copying the ability to have your fourth drop in your dam is super weird. <laughs> you have to copy it when the drop comes, so you can't do it during the uh, during the time where the during the flow mm -hmm. from the head stream. You yeah, have, you have to do it yeah. during your turn, and then it's, it's really funky. So if some, one of the player has that ability that they can they can hold four drops on a level three dam, then you lose one ability and then it's even clunkier. That ability though of uh, holding four drops in your level three dams, I love that ability. Just in a, in a, on its own, I find that one's really fun to build around because then you can have really big late game production actions. I also, I find the one that you get to pay for to replace cement mixers or excavators really fun just because you if you can get that early conduit tile and pair it with that like you were saying aurora it's just such a helpful combo and i also find the uh the one where you can build dams for just three sort of uh three of the yeah. what are they cement mixers or what whatever they are that you pay for dams yeah i find that one's really wonderful because you can almost use it to bully people and build up in the mountains earlier if you, if you uh, play the you... physical board game you will know that those are uh, space invaders yeah, <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's yeah, that's great. <laughs> they do look like, exactly like little space invaders. Jake, do you feel the same way about the country powers? So I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, first, I think I'm exactly opposite with Aurora, where I really try and play around my power on my board, and then the production benefits I just view as tactical considerations, right? Where it's like, okay. I'm building something. So I might as well now look at what production I'm going to unlock and maybe use that to inform what I'm going to build. Whereas, I don't know, I feel like the the uh, the powers from the boards are really powerful. And especially the one that I think it, it might be USA where you get an extra energy every time water flows through one of your power plants, like regardless of how it got there. Feels like a really cool build around one to me, I don't know if I think it's the most powerful, strictly speaking, but I think that's the one I've had the most fun playing with. Um, so yeah, so just want to put that out there that I think I kind of flop with Aurora on the way I'm thinking of these asymmetries strategically and tactically. And then the other thing general, as a general point about asymmetries, um, I mean, I think I mostly agree that the you know individual powers are more build around, but I think the designers just do such a good job of showing restraint and there'll probably be, you know, tons of expansions or whatever that blow this up. But the fact that there's only four different boards make it so much more plausible that they can be balanced and interesting. And I think it's the same with like the starting uh, patent office tiles. Like it's a really tight group that you can start with where I feel like so many lesser games lesser version of this game there you could see there being like 20 different you know random patent tiles that do all kinds of different effects and you probably end up with like a more chaotic or less fun um options than exist in this game so i just think kind of kudos there for you know making sure that everything that is in this game with potent arguably the exception of that one player power that none of us like everything in the game feels awesome to get to have access to and play with. I do love how if I'm playing with a special assistant with the four dams and then also playing as France, that's such a different experience than if I've been given Italy, which Italy just you want to produce often, right? Because you get it you every time you produce energy on the production track, you move it three extra spaces. So just filtering those powers through the decision space of, okay, I want to do a few really big production actions so I can snag the shared contracts versus Okay, what am I? I'm just trying to plink away at water droplets all over the map. And what does that look like? I find it, it's just that keeps the game engaging in a way that is fun and the asymmetry works really well. Do you all try to go for those shared contracts? How 
not the ones that obviously we've talked about the importance of contracts, right? Getting contracts early, especially ones that give you cement mixers or movements really strong. Late game points are really good, but those shared ones that could pay out for 13 or 15. How often do you aim for those? Do you always try to structure your game such that you try to get one or not? Am I, am I always trying to structure them? Is that me being a, a Timmy in the way I approach this game? How, how does that work? I, f- I feel like personally, I sort of let them come to me. Like it's definitely not something that I'm always achieving in the games, but sometimes I sort of start out around it and one is within reach and then I'll angle for it. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, w- I wouldn't say like a huge consideration, especially because, you know, some of the level three contracts you can just get from the contract space are almost as good. Yeah. Um. I sometimes go for them specifically, especially when I manage to uh, build a level five conduit, uh, then I will I will try and go for them. But at other times, I find that they often get like snagged right out of my hand before I manage to get them. So I try not to rely on on our strategy of getting them because somebody else might beat, beat me to it and then they're gone. And, and I, 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 if I build towards that, then it's not great. I also wanted to um, ask if you both know, because you've played this only digitally, uh, the technology dials, you always see all of them in the pattern office. There are uh, five of each level, and you always have three out, and you discard ones that aren't bought, so you always see the whole 15 throughout the game. I can confirm that I did not know that, so thank you for teaching me. I didn't either. And that's another, that's a really brilliant design decision, again, to sort of reduce the amount of variance within the game to some extent, where the game just doesn't need that sort of variety in that way. So that's cool. You can plan on one potentially coming up. Yeah. One, um, one of the first that games that I played, like the third game, was with, uh, with one guy that I already played with and a new guy. And he was like, I want to see all the technology tiles. <laughs> he laid them out on the table, memorized them. And then planned his game based on the technology tiles. And I'm like, it's your first game. <laughs> and, you <won? laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's very impressive. That's a genius but, level but, move right there. I do feel Barrage has some of the... I think one per- thing that does endear people to Barrage is it does feel like a game you could work on almost endlessly, right? There's always things that you could do better in this game, no matter how many times you've played it. Or you said you've played... 70, 80 times at this point. Yeah. Um, and I think that you you in the sh- episode have also said you still see areas that you can improve. And I think that that's a huge part of the appeal for me of Barrage is every game feels different and I always feel like I could be getting better. But I'm curious, what what sets Barrage apart for you, for you two? Apart from what? <laughs> apart from other games. Why, Aurora, why is it a 10 for you, Jake? Why, why a 9.5? I think for me, it's a 10, uh, both because of how well uh, the f- how, how good the feedback is in this game i i always love getting feedback and i keep getting feedback from this game like oh i could have done this better oh i could have done this better and i really like that it i i like games that give me good feedback because then i i know how what i did wrong and i know how i can do better next time um yeah a slight interjection regarding getting better in games um to get to get better at games, it's not always enough to play them because uh, at a certain point, you've reached a kind of saturation to your level and you have to stop and go sit back and think about the game, strategize about the game, talk to other people about the game, uh, which is why I have a competitive Keyforge blog to get better at Keyforge because writing about Keyforge makes me a better player. And uh, I don't do that with Barrage. Uh, because the feedback is so clear, I feel like I am constantly improving from just playing. I explore different parts of the game and I get better at it. Now, I, I could definitely get much better if I sat down and strategized, but it's really a good, it's a really good feeling to play a game and get better at it just from playing, because that's fun, you know? We play to have fun and we also get better at it. So the learning experience is also fun, which is why I think I rate this game so highly. From the from the first game that I played, I was like, oh my God, I want to play again so I can do that better. I really just want to emphasize what you just said because I think it's so brilliant, Aurora. The amount of feedback in a, a game has, a game offers you, the easier it is to get better through just playing it. 
that's one of those like brilliant observations where when you hear it, you're like, oh yeah, how did I, how did my brain never connect those two lines? Right. And the more, the less feedback there is, the harder it's going to be to get better just from playing. That's so interesting. I think for me, the, it's kind of twofold. Why the, the, what sets it apart? The first being what I kind of brought up in my intro about the fact that this is a very mean, very punishing game. And yet, even when I'm getting destroyed, I still feel like the game allows you to have fun. I still I still get to play with my engines. I still get the same amount of workers as anybody else to place. And I kind of get to do as much in that round as anybody else. That sets it apart from some of these other sort of heavy, highly interactive and punishing Euro games that I've played before. So I think that sets it apart. And the other thing is just the fun of the challenge where to set up like an extended metaphor. I feel like this game is asking you to like bail water out of a boat with a bucket with a hole in it. And then it gives you the tools that you need to patch your bucket. But like by like picking up the tool, it's like opening up another leak in your boat, right? Where it's like if the game gives you like 75% of the tools that you need to achieve like a really fantastic well-running engine. Like it gives you almost enough uh supplies right that to to build um the infrastructure you need and and it gives you the resources that you can get extra supplies so that you do have enough but by doing that you're foregoing the opportunity to get the tiles that you need to actually build the things that you want to build efficiently or you're foregoing the water that you actually will need to go into your system to run for energy so i feel like you're always sort of like chasing that dragon where it's like, I can go down one way and achieve everything I need over here, but then I'm letting something go on the other end. So finding that balance has just been a total joy. And it's really fun to navigate each way you choose to go in this game too. I think Barrage for me just captures the best of optimization style Euro games that, but, but everything I love about interactive games. Like when I play Babylonia, Reiner Kinesia tile lane game, right? What I love about that is that I have to evaluate, evaluate all my decisions based on what my opponents might do. And oftentimes, you know, a lot of the Euro games that we've covered on the show, just the strategic optimization Euros, a lot of them worker placement games. It, I don't feel the joy of being kicked in the teeth in the way that you really do feel it in Barrage. But one of the great things about Barrage is oftentimes when you'll do something to leave yourself open to really being interrupted or disrupted within the game because it seemed like a good idea at the time. And I think that that's, that's really great. Like the, the fact that I, so many times, you know, I've started, I've opened a game. There's been a juicy little neutral dam on the bottom left with a water droplet. Oh, wouldn't it be nice? I'll just start off, produce some energy in round one. And then that ends up being my undoing as everyone else builds above the investments I've made early on. And I think that it's just really interesting. It doesn't quite get to the level of having to think about every turn, right? Every decision, what someone else is going to do. But there's enough of it there that it teases that, it, it appeases that desire in me that where I love to play sort of simultaneous choice fighting games, right? But it also appeases the whole, I want to sit and do my own thing on my own board. Please don't touch me. Just enough. I, I mean, there's not a ton of it here, but there's just enough. And it's great. I don't know. This game feels, I, I want more people to just take Barrage as a template of sort of a shared board. This, this separate thing, and then my personal player board, that nexus of, of interactions that are all impacting each other and informing each other because it's such a rich decisional machine. I don't know. I want more themes like Barrage where there's such direct conflict and such direct interaction between the players and it's not combat. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. And I just want more people like me that are like scared of games that are weighted at 4.09 to try barrage because it's you look at the board game geek page that weights up there it's dark red it's really scary uh i know my preferences for midway euros um and and the bad experience i've had with these games before but i feel like i almost feel like the weight is the because of the amount of feedback because of the how well the signposting is done it truly is a heavy game i'm not going to say that it doesn't like deserve that weight but it does everything to make that weight like as accessible and fun as possible. So I hope other people that are hesitant to try this one 
do give it a try, especially because it's so readily available on Board Game Arena. It's, you know, it's easy one to recommend people seek out and try for themselves there. I guess as we move towards the, the end of this episode, do either of you have closing thoughts on Barrage? Things, just even interesting observations or... I'm going to say at the outset, my interesting observation is going to be, I'm going to propose a rematch to both of you <laughs> right now on Board Game Arena because I need more. I need more. Um, yeah. I think one of the most interesting things for me about Barrage that there is an expansion and I don't really play it. It's available on BGA and I, I, don't, I don't play it. Like I am in a game with the expansion right now and I'm just not interacting with it at all. It's just I have enough game in the game without the expansion. I do like the additional uh, um, company boards though. Those add a lot. Yeah. I guess my interesting observation, we'll be going back to our episode last week on asymmetry and how I really don't like games generally that we were describing as like asymmetric games, you know, like Root um, and some of the- You could say it, Cosmic Encounter, just say it. Yeah, and I've had a hard time with those. (laughs) And I feel like they're hard, they're, they're less accessible because of it. But I think games with strong asymmetric elements like Barrage can actually give you a lot of that joy of strong asymmetry, but in a way that makes the game more approachable. Like for me, it was easier to learn because I could try and pick the same company board, you know, the same country, one of those same patent tiles and kind of like learn with that. Um, and, and find my lane in the game that way. And that was a really cool way to onboard with the game. So I think my takeaway kind of a little bit back to the last episode, but a lot of those insights were derived from how much barrage we had been playing going into the recording of that episode. I think also that the, the company board uh, provides an interesting asymmetry where it mostly just affects you. Uh, <laughs> it's not like in, in Root where you have to figure out how the hell do I kill those I don't know, crocodile plants or whatever they are. <laughs> I don't yeah. know how they work. I don't know how to kill them. <laughs> uh, but in, in Barrage, this mostly affects you. Uh, your company board, yeah. your your special abilities. Yeah, if you know what your opponent's powers are, you can better adjust and plan to what they might be doing. But you can just focus on your own stuff and it will still be uh, asymmetric and your experience will be different with a different board and you have plenty to explore. Um it, I think, like, in this way, it's closer to, like, Spirit Island, where your mm. board is you, and this is how you operate in the game uh, that changes. Also, Spirit Island is cooperative, so you you can just ask your opponent what they're going to do, <laughs> and they're not going to just put crocodile plants in your, uh, <laughs> in your clearing, and then you don't know what to do with them. Totally. I think that's such a great point, too, Aurora, that it... So much the company powers are just infecting the decisions that you're making on a shared board, and they don't apply to the interactive elements, and that helps keep it feel. I don't know. Yeah, it helps the spirit of the theme a lot. I yeah, this is a good one. I'm so thankful to our patrons for asking us to review Virage. Aurora, so thankful to you for playing so many games with us and coming on the show. I uh, this is a great reminder, I think, for Jake and I that sometimes you got to push into the heavy space because yeah. it's worth it. Sometimes it's some, it can be not always, but yeah. I, and I just want to say Aurora, thank you so much again for coming on. It was a total blast chatting with you. If you're willing, we'll have to have you on again. Um, and I want to shout out one more time. You have a Keyforge competitive Keyforge blog. Is that still at timeshapers.com? Yes, it is. And so we'll include a link to that in the show notes. Is there anything else that you're working on that you want to shout out here? I am working on some games because I'm an aspiring game designer, but there's nothing to show for it right now. Okay, well, we'll we'll keep we'll keep the listeners posted, and uh, if people want to see you working on it in real time, you can join our Discord and head to the Design Space channel, where there are great game designers like Brendan and Aurora and others uh, chatting about game design and what they're working on all the time. And I also want to shout out Aurora has w- written two articles for DecisionSpacePodcast.com. Most recently, a Count Stop uh, strategy article, which is really interesting. And then also a review of Seven Wonders Architects. So thank you for writing those. You should all go check them out. And then, yeah, I guess, Jake, uh, what are we doing? What's our next game? We're going to cover Messina. 
1347? Yep. Messina and then I think Resistance after that are sort of our next two planned ones. So don't hold us to it, but that's what we've got in the hopper. And then, of course, more uh, topic-based what we talk about episodes um, and, you know, frivolous fun episodes. Maybe we'll do some drafting or top 10 lists, all that stuff coming soon on Decision Space. So with that, thank you all so much for listening so long into this episode. I really hope that you've enjoyed the conversation between Brendan, Aurora, and I, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Let's just make sure to thank, as always, Hembry for our intro and outro music, Reach Out. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Come